my colleague Asha Hauser has has been saying something for the past couple of months that has really stuck with me. And that is that um, she's no longer talking about folks that are on the margins, but folks with targeted identities. And it reminds me of, of now that we're seeing, quote unquote, seeing more people from the margins at the center, does that center become like a bullseye target, right? So is that the image that 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 we that we're creating by bringing folks from the margins to the center without support, without without care and without without love? Just to be able to say that we're diverse. Right. And so we hear we hear a lot about that word diversity we hear a lot about the words diversity equity and inclusion as a phrase right now um and but that wasn't always the case you know we didn't always talk about diversity equity and inclusion in that order right we didn't even always talk about all three of them and full disclosure you all know that um that i am your part-time co-lead minister um, and in my other life, I am a consultant around um, equity. And one of the things that I know is that the, the genre, the, the area, the grouping of what's become this full-blown industry of diversity, equity, and inclusion has just spread like wildfire. So between May and September of 2020, and those dates are important, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, related job postings increased by 123%. This was in some of the height of the pandemic, right? So while everything else is closing down, shutting down, diversity, equity, and inclusion is bursting forth into, into our everyday lexicon, everyday jargon. And it's not a coincidence that that was also the same time as this, the summer of our resistance, right? Those two things are inexorably linked together, that we would see what was going on in, in Minneapolis and, and other communities and think that there needs to be some kind of response. What do we do? How do we do this? And it's interesting to see the, the evolution of the terms. So in the 1960s, we talked about diversity. We talked about the need to have more people of color in all different levels of institutions, higher learning, all of the different places that, that, that we knew we could be. And it was really about when we were talking about diversity, it was really talking about um, being able to be seen, having the numbers, making sure that affirmative action was working to get people um, opportunities that were really important and necessary in our communities. And then in the 1980s, we see that term diversity kind of changing and we start hearing the word inclusion more and inclusion somehow kind of got almost equated to diversity right as though they're the same things and they're not they're really not the diversity is about creating a community comprised of people who have various different backgrounds and um and lived experiences Inclusion was about finding a way to make sure that all of those people feel fully valued, that they were fully validated, that, that those lived experiences had value, that it wasn't just a matter of just being there. So then we enter into the, the 2010s and 2020s and we start talking about equity. And, and why do we start talking about equity? We start talking about equity because we notice that all of this diversity and, and inclusion 
are leading to higher levels of increased conflict and misunderstanding. And that's really be one of the reasons that it is, is because there's this struggle to not just accept, but celebrate our differences. It wasn't any more about that, that 1960s um, kind of, I don't see color, we're all the same, we're all equal. Now folks are saying, no, we are different. And those differences are beautiful. Inclusion doesn't mean that we just pretend that those differences don't exist. It means that we acknowledge those differences and we use those differences to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive communities, the kind of communities that we want to see in the world. Now, as a Unitarian Universalist, the Unitarian Universalist liberatory theology, as I understand it, is all about equity. It's all, that's, that's what it's about. Equity as in everyone gets what they need to be successful, that they are not just surviving, but thriving. Because that thriving, that, that spot is where the spark of creativity, the, the things that we couldn't do alone that we can do together collaboratively, that's when that happens. As universalists, our faith is grounded on the idea that our theological mandate for liberation, or to put it in the terms that, that were then, is to create heaven on earth. So what does it mean to create? What, what does it mean to create that, that community of not just diversity, not just inclusion, but equity? Because as Aisha also says, it's never been about inclusion. It's always been about liberation. So happily, I believe that we are in full on throes of creation. I, I really do believe that we are in a moment of creativity, of creation, of, of curiosity and imagination and thinking about the things that haven't been and what could be. But folks, I, I do also have to admit that sometimes creation isn't really pretty, right? Like, let's be honest, right? Sometimes like when you have bugs and they're larva and you're like, oh, that's kind of gross and icky. Um, you know, that, that maybe doesn't look really pretty, but it's still creation, right? And sometimes creation has unintended consequences. You know, we have explosions of stars in the universes, which hundreds and millions of thousands of light years later create a dinosaur extinction. That was just some, some little atom wanting to be free and, and then, oh gosh, look at, look at what happened over there. The entire species goes extinct. There are many, many creation stories that talk about unintended consequences. Many of our cultures have them as part of their basis of how we as human beings came into being. And many, what, what kind of holds them all together um, is this idea that the first tries sometimes go awry. Like sometimes they just don't go the way that we thought they were going to go and, and we need a do over. And so in the Popovo, which is um, of the Maya, the Kiechi people of the Maya is part of their creation stories, it starts with the mud people and the creator realizes the mud people, that's just not going to work because if they get wet, they just dissolve. And they go into the wood people and the wood people are a little bit more sturdy, but they have no emotion. They have no, they have no memory. They have no way of, of really interacting with, with the world. And the creator gets very frustrated by this time. Let's put in all this effort to make the mud people and that hasn't worked. Put in all this effort to make the wood people and that hasn't worked. 
And so the creator sends, that's right, a flood, a flood to just kind of like clear, clear the decks and start over again. And the next creation that comes are humans. Tepapu and Quetzalcoatl of the Aztecs also have a creation story of sending the flood and starting over again. And of course, in the Old Testament, we have the story of Noah, who when God has seen all there is to see about his creation and her creation says, this is just not going well. People are wicked. This is not what I intended. I need to start all over again. But you know what? The animals, it really wasn't their fault. So we're going to put the animals on the ark with Noah and his family. And we're just going to, you know, try and see what, what we can do about this. But every, everybody else, everything else has to go. So those are just some of the creation stories that we see. And we think about this kind of as we're thinking about, do we have to really have that start over, right? Do we really have to have that thing where we just clear everything out and just go, you know what? It's just start, let's just start completely all over. And the reason I think about this, about these creation myths is I think that we're in that, as Unitarian Universalists, that we're in that second creation. I think that we are in that moment where in the 1960s and 70s, we made promises that we couldn't keep and didn't keep in terms of who we wanted to be as a covenantal faith. And we, we didn't do, we, we didn't do, we didn't practice our faith well, right? We put people in, we, we started to put people at the center and that center became a bullseye. And, and we can see this happen in, in our own modern times as well. We see, we see athletes like Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka and, and politicians like Alexandria Acosta-Cortez and the women's versus the men's pro soccer teams. We see how we bring people to the center and then we have impossible standards for them. Just impossible standards. And going back to Lauren Hill, who set those standards? Who stands to gain from those standards? Are they standards that had the intention or the creation of the folks that we are now setting in the center? I'm not so sure. From a lived experience, I can tell you that I've seen it happen in Unitarian Universalist spaces, that when those who demand equity are then targeted to be held to a higher standard. Religious professional of colors have always been needing to be always on, never making a mistake, often criticized for holding up the mirror to the congregation that the congregation said that they wanted. 2018 was a tumultuous year in Unitarian Universalism and religious professionals of color came under attack in unprecedented numbers. Many left. It felt like we were having echoes of the 1960s and 70s in Unitarian Universalism. Today, many of those same religious professionals of color who remain are hanging on to their ministries by a thread, often targeted with the policies and procedures initially set up for white male ministers of privilege. 
So let me be super clear. This is not to say that these folks shouldn't be held accountable. Of course, we should be held accountable. Absolutely, we should be held accountable as religious professionals. My question is, it's the standards and who gets to set those standards that is at issue? Because the standards and who gets to set them are allowing these religious professionals of color to be made a target. Standards and policies that we had no part in the creation of are now being used as weapons. It takes humility and vulnerability to admit when we don't know something. I know that when I have to admit that I don't know something, it usually comes from a pretty vulnerable place. But when do we learn that? As children, we're often encouraged to learn, to admit mistakes, to say we're sorry. When does that shift? Why does it shift? Why can't we continue to embrace that learning, that vulnerable space with each other? So what would it look like to support people as they move from the margins to the center? What would it look like so that center isn't that bullseye target? Do you know what it feels like? Do you know what it looks like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Have you asked? Where in your life and in community could you ask? Or perhaps the question has already been asked and folks just thought that the answer was too difficult or complicated. Things like prison abolition. Is it really that difficult and complicated? I invite you to do the asking and exploring what it means in your life and community and soon so this explosive creation period that we are in is one of beauty and not rather than the one of the flood. This sermon today is dedicated to all of the peoples of the globe currently under the fists of oppression as they struggle to get free, particularly the people of the Ukraine and Congo.